for today's topic is an identification of clay minerals. In identification of clay minerals, there are two types are there. That is one is the physical methods of identification. Another one is called chemical methods for identification. So what is what are these and what are the types are there? What is their role? How we are going to identify? And mostly very first interesting topic is called X-ray diffraction. Very useful. This is the way we can use the sample again and again. If you go for this type of analysis, we can use the sample again and again. It's a non-destructive method. Another one is called electron diffraction studies. There some electrons and electromagnet. Another one is called electron microscopy. The image, I think in Google, if you if you search some any images for the clay minerals, you will get this electron microscopy images. At layer layer, we can see. And DTA. DTA is nothing but differential thermal analysis. Differential thermal analysis. Uh, that is a differential thermal analysis. And another one is called surface area. So based on surface area, you know, naturally, whenever we study about any mineralogical subject, we always study what is the surface area of so-called mineral and what is the surface area of another mineral. Like that, we can identify. So these are the major methods and physical methods. These are the physical methods. These are all X-ray diffraction method, electron diffraction studies, and electron microscopy, differential thermal analysis, and surface area. Coming to the chemical uh, chemical methods, we can see CEC, cation exchange chemicals. We can see there and molar ratio, potassium determination, and Y index. Some electrometric properties. So like this, we can see what are the what are the different methods of identification of clay minerals. Now we will follow the further further slides will be continued like this. Very first one, students. The, the very first, we will see the differential thermal analysis. So it's the destructive analysis, students. So differential thermal analysis is complete destructive analysis. The destructive analysis means the sample we can't use. Once we use the sample, we have to destroy that sample. We can't reuse the sample again, which is quite opposite in X-ray diffraction. Mostly in thermal analysis, a material is heated. Its structure and chemical composition undergo such changes such as fusion, melting, crystallization, oxidation, decomposition, and transition, expansion, stirring, etc. So the, all these conditions will be happen. So using this thermal analysis, such changes can be monitored even at upper, upper, upper interest of atmosphere, atmosphere pressure. The obtained information is very useful for both quality control and problem, problem solving. So this type of analysis, we, may, we will we'll go for some thermal heating and we will see what kind of uh, changes were happening in our uh, in, uh, Present uh, given respective pressure and temperature or present and at atmosphere, and this type of uh, this type of analysis is very useful for both quality control. We can see how much quality is there, quality of mineral we can judge, and also is there any other problem is there we can judge that problem also. So now we will see very in detail regarding the thermal analysis. What are those conditions? So methods based on thermal properties. So completely as I said that here we will see some thermal changes. So what are those? Very first, differential thermal analysis. See, students, is nothing but just comparing with the inert, uh, inner, inert reference. You see this, uh, read this line, the temperature difference between sample and inert reference material. So this is what, differential thermal is equal to sample by reference. Is measured as, a, as, a, uh, as both are subjected to the identical heat treatment. That means we will take one sample of our interest and we will go for reference sample. Reference sample means we know the properties of that particular sample. We know the particular sample. So we will heat our sample, our unknown sample, the collected from the soil, and the reference sample. Reference sample means we know the, all the properties at how much temperature it will go for melting, at how much temperature it will go for other uh, chemical reactions, everything. We, we, we will have a proper knowledge on this. So we will compare. So for thou, up to 1000 degrees, how much, uh, what are the changes happening between them? So by comparing with the reference sample, we can identify what kind of mineral is there, what kind of clay minerals is there. And another one is called differential scanning calorimetry. Here also the same thing will happening. Either sample and reference is maintained at same temperature, even during a thermal event in the sample. That means that the changes. So what will happen here? After when we heat, after we, we take the sample to after a certain, certain range of temperatures, and the amount of energy required to maintain zero temperature between the difference between the Right. 
So regarding with the thermal analysis, uh, sorry, differential scanning calorimetry, you will see the uh, after heating, after taking the sample and reference to upon certain thermal even, that means certain certain temperatures, what we will do? We will calculate the energy required. So how much energy required to maintain zero temperature between the sample and the reference will be calculated. This is a formula for that. We have a small d dq by dt. Is that this is a sample? So difference, how much energy is required to maintain the zero? How much calorimetric energy is required zero will be calculated. That is called the differential scanning calorimetry. Another one is called thermogravimetry analysis or methods, TGA, that's thermogravimetric analysis. Here, we will heat the temperature and we will see how much mass is being lost by the sample. Is a thermal, just quite similar to our gravimetric analysis in our regular chemical analysis. This is thermogravimetric analysis. That means, that means, so thermogravimetric analysis means the change in mass of the sample on heating is measured. So on heating, definitely there will be some loss of mass in the sample. So we will calculate how much mass is being lost by that particular sample. And we will, we will check the difference in the mass. So this causes thermogravimetric, uh, thermogravimetric analysis. So these are the three different analysis. One is called thermal, differential thermal analysis, differential scanning calorimetry, that means how much energy is required to maintain the zero temperature. It's called D, DS, that's called differential scanning calorimetry. Another one is called DGA, that's called thermogravimetric analysis, that means how much mass is being lost by the particular sample is being calculated in this type of analysis. So, so these are the uh, analysis, in, uh, this is, this is, this is, these are thermal properties. So now coming to the, our original theme, that's called differential thermal analysis. So mostly this, the, uh, this type of experiment or this type of analysis is very useful for both crystalline and amorphous material also, which is very, very important. Even we can calculate, we can identify the amorphous material in this type of analysis, but where, which is not possible in X-ray diffraction analysis. So what will happen means here, we'll put our unknown sample, we will put in the we will put in the instrument we use our unknown sample and the reference sample also and we we heat it both the samples side by side from zero to thousand degrees celsius okay students so that as i said before the reference the reference material is a standard material it's not normally it will be thermally inert and we know how much what is peculiar characteristics so now we will see a number of compounds have been used so for this thermal for the for this uh, reference material there are many compounds like a Al2O3, aluminum oxides, and cal calcinated kaolinite. We have used calcinated kaolinite. So these are the few inert components has been used. So the heat was controlled uniformly and study rate through the analysis. So heat will be just, just we know, we just we can't uh, go through or he give the heat in a very random way. We'll, we will increase it in study by step by step, slow by process. Then only we will give the particular heat analysis. We will, we will heat the sample in a very study rate. So I, mostly this heating range will start from 0 0.1 degree Celsius to 2000 centigrade Celsius per, per minute. So naturally heating mostly, what is the rate of heating? It will be around mostly for the most of the purpose for the for, uh, mostly we can go up to 20 degrees per minute. For 20 degrees per minute also is used. So what will happen during this uh, heating process, unknown sample undergo some thermal reactions. That is what happening uh, if any substance if we go on, go on heating, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particular given at, a, at, a, at known temperature, definitely there will be some transformation. There will be some changes will be there. So these changes, so the difference in changes between the unknown and reference sample, we will plot one graph. So by comparing our reference sample, the so-called reference, reference and our unknown sample. Unknown sample means our soil sample, our unknown sample. So we will go, we will, we will heat the samples at this temperature, the so-called temperature is from 0 0.1 to 2000 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius. So we'll, we'll go for thermal thermal reactions and we'll plot one graph called, plotted one graph. How that graph will be look, sir? It will be look like this. So we, I will show that graph. So generally that graph has the two types of peaks. One is called the endothermic peak and the one is called the exothermic peak. So this is endothermic peak, exothermic peak. So what is this endothermic and exothermic peak? So it is nothing but read this line. If the temperature of an unknown sample, the sample which we collected, becomes lower than the reference sample, delta T is negative. That means, say for example, this is a baseline. This is a baseline. So this is a sample. So if our sample was, so, so we heated our sample, that sample, our, our collected sample was very less in temperature. 
So the graph will be lower than the reference sample. This is a reference sample temperature, but our sample was very low, uh, undergo very less temperature changes than our reference sample. So the peak will be downward. This is called the endothermic peak. But it's quite reference. When the temperature, when the temperature of our known sample was very high than the reference sample, the it will the, the, the delta T will be here in negative, but here in an exothermic peak, the delta T will be in a positive. That means it is quite opposite. So it will go, it, it will show the upper up, upward peak development. That is called the exothermic peak. Mostly, if the delta T, if the, if, if the, if the delta T, the temperature difference this is called delta T, students. This is called delta T. If the, del if the delta T is zero, there is no difference. That means it was following this baseline. What will happen? There is no change means uh, between the unknown and different sample. It is called it, it is considered the baseline, and I didn't, it will be any bay, it will be a straight line purpose. So if it is low, means it will go downward. If it is high, means it will go upward. But if the, there is no any temperature, if there is no any temperature uh, difference, means what will happen? It will be only in a straight line, it will it will follow the baseline. Better, I will show the I will show the original graph which are included in this PPT. So the mostly this curvatures with peaks serves as a fingerprint. Yes, this curvature, this graphs, the so-called graphs will be serves as a fingerprint that will use at a specific temperature at, at which the peak develop as diagnostic for the identification of minerals. Generally, these graphs will give a will give a proper information. Generally, it will be considered as a fingerprint for the particular mineral. Generally, differential thermal can be performed with a liquid or solid samples. We can use both liquid sample and solid sample. When the soil samples are whole, uh, when the, with the soil sample, whole soil, sand, silt, or clay fractions can be used. So we can use any type of sample we can use. We can use whole soil sample, or we can take sand, sand surface, silt surface, or even we can take the clay fractions also. We can take for the differential thermal analysis. So naturally, when the whole soil sample were analyzed, there is less than Two millimeter fraction should be treated with 30% H2O2 to remove the organic matter, which may interfere, giving a strong exothermic reaction. So, students, we use this H2O. What is H2O2? Hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. Where we use hydrogen peroxide in our regular uh, organic matter decomposition. Which experiment we use? Other than this, other than this differential thermal analysis, we use in another experiment also. What is that? Organic, organic carbon extinction. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. There is one experiment. We use H2O2. What is that? In that experiment also, we destroy the, the organic matter. Textural method. analysis. Soil textural analysis. Um, finally, you got it. It's the soil texture analysis. We use... Uh, actually, there are two types of texture analysis. One is... Uh, International pipette method and hydroscopic method. Uh, in Coimbatore, mostly they follow uh, international pipette method. In that, in there, they use this H2O2. H2O2 to destroy the uh, to destroy the organic matter. Why they why they use H2O2 in that texture analysis? Can anyone answer? Why they use uh, H2O2 to destroy the organic matter? Any any reason is there? Illuminati don't answer. You 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 have full subject. Can anyone answer? Other than uh, Illuminati and uh, Mr. Adam, you also don't answer. You both are you both are in the subjective. So any other so like Shubash, we can answer. Whether best we can also answer. And my favorite NRS in the student, you should answer. No, sir. No, actually, while we are doing texture analysis, we should you know organic matter will act as a binding agent between the particles. Right? It will act as a binding agent. So while doing texture, so like this, we 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 destroy the organic matter content by using H2O2 to remove the organic matter. So if this organic matter present in the sample, what will happen? It will give a strong exothermic reactions because organic matter also with the, the temperature variation, organic matter also will be added to the added to the peak. What will happen? The peak will be shown very high. If we show like if it is show like this, we will get a wrong data analysis. To avoid this, we use H2O. So in general analysis, whole soil gives a only peak of low intensity. Same peaks are very large and intensity. So these are all practical way of things. So this is regarding, I will show that uh, original graph of ETA. Yeah, this is what study. This is what I, I want, I need to explain. So when your temperature was more than the sample, your, your non sample temperature was more than the reference sample. This is called the reference line. If it is more than your peak will be goes up. The delta T will be in positive. The temperature variation will be in positive. This is called the exothermic reactions. 
if the if it is less than the baseline that is delta t it is called the endothermic reaction so this is the variation students so here the delta t is a negative here the delta t is a positive so if, if in case if in case there is any no changes it will follow the baseline it will follow the baseline and it produce only straight line the graph will be in a straight line there will be no change so this is this is this is regard these are the graphs regarding the, the thermal analysis so what is this endothermic and exothermic reactions nothing is there but we will read about this the thermal re reactions contribute changes in temperature of the sample generally dehydration removal of water d hydroxylation fusion evaporation sublimation yields to the endothermic reactions so here the dehydration de dehydroxylation fusion evaporation and sublimation yields to the endothermic reaction so on the other hand oxidation crystalline structure formation some decomposition reactions comes under the exothermic reactions so these are the few uh, type of reactions which involve in the endothermic and exothermic reactions now we will see about what is happening so say so continuing the what is what are the advantages of the dta that is differential thermal analysis instrument can be used at very high temperature so there is no problem with the instrument because generally in soil science instruments will be very sensitive we always should always much uh, we should take very much care about our sensitivity of the instrument but in this instrument there is no problem we can go for very high temperatures as even though it is we can maintain at high temperature the instrument will be very sensitive we will get a very pak analysis characteristic transition and reaction temperatures can be accurately determined so determining of the particular analysis was very very accurate but what are the what is the disadvantage there there is some sort of uncertainty there is some sort of confusion of in between the fusion transition reaction estimated there is a chance of 20 to 50 percent there is a chance of it. there is some uncertainty in heat if there is any problem in the heat by supplying of heat means definitely we will get some wrong result we, will, we won't get any proper or pakka analysis this is only disadvantage in the in the differential thermal analysis now we will see another slide what is happening another so this is regarding differential thermal analysis i hope if we, you have to keep only few things what is exothermic peak what is endothermic peak and it is a destructive analysis we can't use sample again and again once we use you know and this type of analysis is completely used for both crystalline structures the so called crystalline structures and amorphous structures both we can use this differential thermal analysis and there are many type of differential calorimetric analysis i have already shown just we, we will once we will brush up all the yeah this one differential thermal differential scanning calorimetry and thermogravimetric analysis so these are the three type of analysis we have uh, we have learned so these are the important things you have to remember in dta that is differential thermal analysis now we will see the x ray diffraction analysis very well, this is very good very nice this is also one of the excellent uh, it's a unique technique used in the identification of clay minerals and it gives a qualitative analysis it will give a very qualitative but it is a quantitative it is, but it is a qualitative analysis how good for material is it it is a non destructive method meaning sample we can use for again and again so once we use any sample we have used for this x ray diffraction we can use the sample for another analysis also so we can use this this tech non destructive analysis however the method is not you are not the major disadvantage of this type of analysis is it can't be used for amorphous and non crystalline structure can anyone answer why can anyone answer why we can't use this uh, uh, application leoracy and adam please both of you don't answer let your friends to be answered can anyone answer no crystal structure in amorphous minerals okay there will be no crystal structure in amorphous okay i know that so what is the relation between there is there is no there is no x ray diffraction in Ah, good. Use that word. Good, good. There is extra diffraction. So then, naturally, if there is no proper arrangement of uh, ions or everything, it will be a big problem. So that's why we can't use this excess in amorphous and non-crystalline minerals because there is no proper arrangement of uh, clay lattice. So now coming to this base of the base of use extra diffraction is is a systematic. Uh, what is what is the base for this? What is the base for this extra diffraction analysis? It must use completely systematic arrangement of atoms and ions in the crystal plane. so this is the major fundamental base for this analysis this arrangement you know whatever the excess was was spread on these atoms or ions they will give a they will reflect a, a definite intensity of x rays so we will calculate so this is a base so each material species is characterized by specific atomic arrangement 
we have learned we have learned all these things regarding the what is a crystalline unit what is a clay unit uh, what is a body centered phase centered we have learned many things in our previous videos if anybody have not not attend that class please go through i have provided the link please go and uh, see that video for once about this a specific arrangement of atoms and uh, creating my god there's no power okay creating characteristic atomic planes so oh, right each each material has specific a specific atomic arrangement ca creating characteristic atomic planes that can be diffract diffract means reflect the x rays so this characteristic planes that means arrange that planes you know we have we have learned that word, that arrangement of that layers crystal layers like uh, uh, what is that uh, silica tetrahedra aluminum octahedra one is to one two is to one two is to two is to one is to one we have learned many things now so it means that that specific arrangement of atoms will be read by this x rays so in most of the crystalline the atomic spacing or crystalline planes are almost same dimensions as the wavelength of rays so almost the wave nature of wave nature and dimensions of the crystal planes will be same that's why we can use this xrays very first students lev a great scientist this person i first identified this uh, can be used this xrays for the our identification we can identify with this person 1912 so diffraction pattern mostly used for fingerprint of identification of minerals so this diffraction pattern so the so called uh, diffracted pattern will use as a fingerprint for the identification of mineral species so this is regarding x-ray diffraction analysis but i will we will go very in depth what is this x-ray so generally students how is x-rays are produced very elementary we may have our usually learn plus two question generally we will, we will use some fast moving electro uh, fast moving electron hitting a metal target by hitting a fast moving electron by hitting a metal target what will actually do you know why this x-rays the name x-ray was start anyhow so generally x-rays are produced by hitting a metal target what will the x-rays is produced so mostly the excited atoms will will be wavelength will be around 0.1 to 100 armstrongs generally there are two types of excess where excess will become or radiation will come uh, we want only one type where so we will block the uh, beta rays with some blocking agents like copper uh, we will block some nickel filters and we release only alpha rays so we use this one type of ray rays we won't use both we won't there is because if you use both we won't get proper analysis so we use only one type of rays the alpha rays we use for isolation for the use of analysis so this beam of copper uh, alpha rays radiation hit the crystalline surface which x rays are scattered so these rays were used for our uh, mineral matter so it will be scattered by the atoms of the crystalline this scattered x rays become quantitative so this scatters with this scattering experiment is only when the particular x rays this so called copper uh, alpha particles potassium alpha particles have been released so this will be hit in the mineral surface the, um, the mineral surface means our unknown sample so it uh, that the rays will be reflected those rays are will be considered only a quantitative only when it obeys the bragg's law so only when it were when those particular rays for example this is a sample and i am i am hitting with some x rays so it, it will also will be it is, there will be some reflections so this reflection these these resultant rays is will be quantitative only when it obeys this law bragg's law it obeys only only this this rays will be will be a quantitative only with obeys the bragg's law what is the formula for bragg's law it is n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta now you see what is the d it is a d spacing between the atomic planes the d is nothing but spacing between that i i have said what is the d spacing in a mineral mineralogy class what is the d spacing can anybody answer what is the d spacing so this is regard this is a bragg's law this is n, n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta where d is a space between the atomic planes and lambda is nothing but wavelength theta is nothing but uh, angle of diffraction and is nothing but order of diffraction and what is this bragg's law sir what is this formula we will see in next slide about this bragg's law so this is the regarding the bragg's law this is the bragg's law bragg's was stated like this when a crystal this is the law students we should be right as such when a crystal is bombarded that means hitted with x rays of a fixed wavelength similar spacing of crystal and plat is in bracket at the certain angle so we are inside we are bombarding that means hitting the x rays x rays with a fixed wavelength at certain angle intensity x rays are produced reflected intensity x rays are produced when the wavelength of scattered x rays interfere con constructively so reflect x rays will be produced when the wavelength of a scattered that x rays x rays will be produced that at, at that interference surface Some scattered, some reflected rays were produced. 
when this constructive in, uh, interference occurs so that interference occurs the diffracted beam of x rays will leave the certain angle equal to the hidden beam i will show the image in next slide just just learn just read this line when the constructive interference occurs when the proper interference constructive interference occurs a different beam of x rays will leave a certain angle equal to the equal to the top incident beam to the top incident beam what are those this is what this is what I, this is what the explanation for that so predict that all planes have certain uh, crystal have diaxed which is the inclined angles of certain incident and beam the angle is theta depend upon the wavelength so whatever the incident rays as per was was spread in angle that angle should be equal to the diffracted rays this is what the bracks law so how much intensity you have been released the angle between these two in the diffracted incident rays should be equal this is what the bracks law says this here you can see the incident beam that is a b c a b c has traveled several wave wavelength further that in that incident of the a b c diffracted from suction equal 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 atomic yields to different sorry on different uh, diffraction magnitude that means whatever the incident rays should be equal to the diffraction rays the angle of incident should be equal in a both diffracted beams this is regarding the atomic uh, bracks law this is regarding the brand i hope you you are getting my point what is, or what i am explaining is regarding with the bracks law so the data mostly this angle is complete depend upon the wavelength so how much wave the, the depend upon the wavelength of x rays how much wavelength we have used that complete this angle is complete depend upon the wavelength and d spacing is called the d spacing between the two layers is called the crystal lattice between two crystal lattice the d spacing so this is regarding the bracks law only your, your so called diffracted ray rays will be quantitative only when it affects this bracks law this bracks law we'll see next about the diffraction law same thing i have explained here incident these are the incident rays these are the scatter rays so all angle should be equal all the angle should be incident angle should be very equal same thing i have what i have so what i have explained uh, just i put in a pictorial representation this is for your preparation purpose same thing this is yeah this is also this is also repeated arrangement the kind of arrangement of crystal lattice of each atom is scattering the points and then what is the kind of what kind of uh, what kind of arrangement is there what kind of uh, layer lattice represents completely read by this incident and reflected x rays or oh, very much so. okay very good very nice but for doing this analysis we need have a we need to we need to prepare a sample for analysis so just like a uh, thermal differential thermal analysis we can't use whole sample here we have to treat the sample we have to go for we have to prepare the sample for to hold the so that those x rays rods so what are those very first we have to use the we mostly we use ethylene glycol or glycerol which replaces the water give a constant interlayer space so generally we, we in, in to replace water we use glycol glycerol or glycol which gives a very constant interlayer so when this water was replaced it, the layers will be very constant will give a very perfect excess drive excess we can use in a very perfect manner at the same time baking at the various high temperatures to destroy the parts of crystal structure generally the, this baking is used generally to to get the pro proper uh, rays proper proper studies they will bake the temperature some high temperature which very slightly will be destroyed not we should not completely we should not destroy but that this we need some very skill to do this type of practice and another experiment another uh, method of method including that saturation with cation so generally we saturate here also to replace all this water molecule etc will saturate with magnesium or potassium they produce some diagnostic structural changes so by using this magnesium potassium also we can we can we, we, can, we will treat the sample um, to get the proper diagnostic structure but here also we will get some sort of problems will be there but we know what what type of cation we use it for that particular sample so these are the few methods which we use for the clay path preparation analysis sample preparation analysis generally we go for diffraction and prepare the random powder sample we use we, we should use powder sample unlike uh, differential thermal analysis we should not we can't use whole sample we use for powder sample as oriented sample and with the aid of glycol clay sample is made into paste that means to replace the water molecule we, we will make it to paste and roll it in a rod actually if anybody have a experiment have a experience in this extra diffraction means they will load the sample into the rod of 0.3 to 0.5 mm thickness 
This powder sample can also be prepared by pushing a paste into the specially designed wedge holders. That means that the holding, that there are some few holders, it will wedge holders, they will use this and we will push that sample. So a currently most popular method mounting X-ray sample is prepared by orienting of small microscopic glass slides. Present, now we are using microscopic glass slides or porous ceramic plates have been used. We are using a glycerol means, why? Because to avoid some problem with water molecules. We use glycerol. Sometimes, as I said, sometimes we use for saturated, we can saturate the sample with potassium and magnesium ions also. So another one is called clay suspension is made properly and pipetted into the slide approximately 15 to 25 milligrams of clay in transparent for 100 centimeters per square. So when we use this glass slides, we should, we should get at least 25 milligrams or 15 to 25 milligram sample should be there. That should be present around 10 centimeters square. So sample should be present between the 10 centimeters square area should be present. So after sample is allowed to dry, so after treating all the sample, we should allow to dry at a room temperature. It is ready for analysis with a direct re direct recording and X-ray spectrometry with X-ray sample and printing charts with it. So generally, what after treating the glycerol, after treating the sample with glycerol, after doing all this experiment, after we after allowing to dry uh, at the area of 10, 10 centimeters square, we'll dry it and we put it under the X-ray spectrometer. And after for some time, it take long time, students, which is not unlike the differential thermal analysis. Here in X-ray diffraction, it will take a long time for getting a printed chart. So after when we get nowadays everything is got a computerized. So after after a few minute, few hours, minutes to hours take very lengthy time, lengthy time. So at that time we will get a printed charts. We will get the printed charts. So this is the this is the what students. After getting all these things, we will we will get one graph like this. We get one graph like this. These are the counts per second. How how much X-rays was used? This is this is a, this is a theta. This is a unit. So for each and every peak is represented the 1, 1 minerals, 1.15 minerals, all those things. These are some sort of graph. Actually, to get, uh, no need to go what in detail about this graph. If you, if there's a different, uh, that, that will be very different. You will learn when, when, you, when you work with this uh, X-ray diffraction, you can came to know about this graph. So another experiment called electron diffraction studies. It's quite similar, quite similar. It's a fast electron means fast electron with a lower penetration energy than the X-ray. This is almost quite similar to the x-ray diffraction the only thing is that here the efficiency is very more than the x-rays these electrons will be penetrated at very low energy but the uh, when compared to the x-rays so and desirable basal spacing clay spacing has been recorded so naturally in this in this electron diffraction we use the basal spacing calculation also this is quite similar the electron diffraction is nothing but in, in here we use like x-rays here we are using fast moving electrons that is only different so if we compare with the X-rays, what is so both are same, sir? Why we should use this one? There is some advantages than the X-ray diffraction. Exposure time may be few seconds to compare with few hours in X-rays. Just now I said it will take some few seconds to few hours in X-rays. Electron beam failed to produce dium, penetrate beyond the surface and is scanned to the X-rays too. So another 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 advantage is the electron beam is to penetrate beyond the surface. It will go very in deep. The electrons can go throughout the sample, but X-rays can't go beyond that one. So there is some, this is the advantage over the X-rays. So we can save the time and we can analyze this very properly when compared with X-ray diffraction, we can use this electron diffraction studies very effectively. So another one, another, another important experiment is called electron microscopy, quite similar. Here electron microscopy, usually we, we nowadays is very famous, we're getting images, we use electron microscope. Here, here also we will use electron beam, Use it for study the shape, size of the particles. Naturally, whatever we so-called electron images all coming from here only. Due to the negative charge of the electron beam have one, one advantage over the electro X-ray diffraction. Due to the negative charges there for the electrons, so this by using these advantages, we can prepare the very microscopic image of our clay mineral. Usually we see mostly like plate-like kyanites. So we can see what is what is the arrangement of kyanite and mount mount till like very clearly in electron microscope and lath shape like non trinite and halosite. So lath shape, plate-like shape, all the shape, we can get the shape also. Even we, but in X-rays or electron diagram, electron, that, that another paper, after that electron, fast moving electron method also, there we can see only some quantity, but here we can, we can read what is the shape, what is, what, what, are, what, are, what are the layers arrangement, everything we can see very clearly. So method analysis, so how we have to do this? In this method, a drop of viscosity clay suspension is used. 
if it is waste on, on a specimen supported in a plastic plate and examining after showing uh, after a shadow casting shadow casting means just we will we'll just, shadow casting you know generally we use in microbiology uh, just we will tilt the slide to to shadow cast to provide a sharper contra contrast lighting so to just spreading in that just spreading and by doing all this thing we will get a better 3d information about the particular surface and well thickness the thickness so this is a better this this is what students we will get a 3d images we will know the shape what about what is arrangement everything we can read from this uh, electron microscope so this is what these are this is what i am saying these are the electron electroscopic images we can see what the shape is there this is the illite one is to one type this is one is to one type so this is the illite this is 71 micrometer uh, range this is and this is a montmorillon light we can see montmorillon light is a two is to one we can see some gaps between the layers you can see the between the layers there we can here we can see so these are the layers we can see layer shape is the halo site you can halo site completely you can see what is the shape is present in you can easily we can see the 3d images and sample light it is another one and like this so these are the few images coming to another one is called molar ratio silica oxide this is nothing but just comparing with silica oxide with other oxides mostly Uh, the similar ratio between silica oxide and other oxides is generally it is 2.4 for montmorillon dominated clay if it is less than 2.4 for kyanite dominated clay fraction so r2 remains the sum of it is nothing but the other sesqui oxides means what are those is iron and aluminum oxide just comparing what ratio between silica oxides and other iron and aluminum oxides is r2 is represented iron and aluminum oxides is just compare it's a molar ratio how much ratio is there we can compare it so another important is called specific surface area is inversely proportional to the particles as depend upon the colloidal nature of the clay from past day one class i am always explaining what is the specific surface area as the particles has decreases specific surface specific surface area will be increases so this can be done by experimentally retaining by the ethanol ethanol glycol we have to treat this uh, ethanol glycol on the on the surface and the value obtained compared with the pure clay metal so After treating all the specific surface by calculating the specific surface area, we can obtain the standard pure clay water. So based on specific surface area, internal surface area, molar ratio, these are the few methods which is used. And so these are the ranges we used ethanol by using ethanol glycol. Ethanol glycol retention is the internal surface area, external surface area, total surface area. What is internal surface area? What is external surface area? I have given the explanation in the, my last video. Internal internal surface is nothing but surface area between the layers. external surface area nothing but the edges surface part it's called the external surface area so these are the surface area etc so i don't want to read all these things no naturally montmorillon it has a very uh, specific a very high spec sorry not montmorillon vermiculite has a very high specific surface area and followed by the montmorillon and very less is kyanite at least that is what this is regarding the kyanite illite montmorillon and muscovite montmorillon chlorite and vermiculite This is regarding uh, so large surface area clay impart there some properties so due to the if you have a very large surface area there will be one peculiar characters will be there what are those swelling shrinking viscosity and sedimentations we can see in the water so very these these are the some and have some colloidal nature also so we have we can get some colloidal nature properties also this is regarding the surface area coming to the next is called electrometric properties almost we now we gone to Is we we came to chemical analysis. It's called this include the potentiometric and conductometric titrations. Conductivity, potentiometry, usually read in this uh, chemical chem chemistry part. Conductivity, all these things. So this is due fact that soil clays retain homoionic. They are homoionic because all are negative. Generally, cations will be observed. And it's with a single cation that will satisfy the charge to enter cation exchange capacity. Nothing homoionic means the clay surface negatively charged. Generally, it will attach with positive charge. Called the homoionic it is one type of ion will be there. Anyhow, this is due to the fact that soil clays retain homoionic with respect to the single cation that satisfies the entire cation exchange capacities. So that uh, that titration of clay gives the information about the exchange capacity and natural properties of the clay. Nothing but our CEC, what the so-called CEC, we calculate now all those things. So the, that that is those are called some electrometric. Our C is electrometric property. And uh, our EC also the electrometric property, pH, and all this comes under the electrometric properties. Come into the potassium determinant. So micaceous clay mineral like illite, muscovite, biotite, and inferred from potassium oxide. So all these are the potassium determinants. So muscovite, 
how much how much potassium so the amount of potassium is determined so based on the potassium determined also we can identify the clay minerals example your muscovite biotite like potassium 9.4 percentage and 10.4 percentage of muscovite for elites is around ranges from 6 to 10 percentage chlorides and vermiculite minerals indicated by the magnesium oxide content also so all this is so there is nothing but the mineral based on the mineral potassium mineral we can identify the what kind of potassium is there another one is called y index one index is, is actually this uh, this index is one mathematical model uh, proposed by the martin and russell this index was combination of potassium content and ethanol glycol retention by the internal surface area and cec it is nothing but students this y index is nothing but it is a combination of the potassium content ethylene glycol retention so by internal surface we will treat the sample with the eg eg solution or ethanol glycol solution and by the internal surface inter actually the internal surface can generally see so by combination of all these four we will get the we, we will get the what is y index so by by multiplying all these by combining all these things we will get one value so it is that form why they have given one formula y index is martin and russell is nothing but 1 by 3 a to 10 into b to 10 into 6 20 20 what is this? this is like a potassium content it's not like on surface area all comes under here so here a is presented for the potassium content b is contained in the internal surface area and c is the cec so by combining all these things we will get some values so some index will get so a is nothing but your potassium content b is your uh, retention content that is so the ethylene glycol solution c is nothing but your cec cation exchange capacity that is the package so why have this both people have done some mathematical this is one type of mathematical mo model for the identifying of clay minerals called the y index now we will see what are those conditions if the value of y index is between 0 0.5 to 0 to 0 to 5 that is that 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 the mostly in this range we can get the kyanite type of clay mineral if it is 5 to 25 it is called the illite type if it is 25 percent and more that is comes under the more to more like this is called the y index this is completely like mathematical model students so 0 0.0 to 5 kyanite type 5 to 25 is the illite type 25 to more it's called the more to more like type now we will see we will see the another one Another one here, finally, we come at the elemental chemical analysis. So, based on chemical analysis, to find out the nature and dominant of the clay in soils, to find out the elemental composition. So, what is the percentage? And also, total percentage would be approximately 100. So, we will, we will find out the chemical by finding out the chemical uh, combination also, we can find out what type of clay minerals are there. So this is this is regarding the this is regarding the chemical analysis. The chemical analysis is nothing but we will see what what type of how much what are the what is the composition present in that particular sample. So finally we are what type of, what type of conclusion we have, I want to give means soil clays being essentially is a mixture. You know soil is very dynamic. Is the different properties will be the mixture of clay suitable combine of these methods. So we are we have to we, we should not restrict to the only one kind of method. We have to use all type of matter that is chosen for identifying not only dominant in mineral but also other mineral subordinate clay fraction also. That means we can have some, we, we, we should not focus only on one type of analysis. We have to go for other type of analysis. We have to go for other uh, diffraction analysis. So a set of analysis are suitable for our analysis should be used. This is overall, we have to, this is overall for today's class. My conclusion is like this. And with this, I'm thank you very much. And um, one minute. With this, I am concluding my class.